Um, my name is Barbara Boshin and I'm from Co-Merchant. Um, Co-Merchant offers two softwares to help you sell on Amazon and Walmart. Co-Merchant helps you relist from Amazon to Walmart and EasyKey helps you automate your keywording on Amazon. Chakra? Hi, my name is Chakra Yandapelli. I'm with uh, Jungle Books. Uh, we provide accounting and financial services for uh, e-commerce sellers, including Amazon, eBay. And tonight, our special guest is Ken Keebler, and he is going to tell us about all the, the sneaky ways, no, all the ways you can sell on um, Amazon Canada, and maybe a little other th few things, um, from someone who's really in the mix. I mean, from a U.S. seller's perspective, um, I want to say it's an afterthought, but it's like an opportunity I don't know how to explore. I don't know where I can play, what I'm up, you know, what I'm up against, what are the sellers like there, and all the other costs. So this is huge. This is great. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. So thank you for having me on tonight. And I have a question: Does Jungle Burks work in Canada? Uh, for Canadian sellers in the US, yes. So if I wanted to do that on my Canada store, could it work? Uh, yeah, we have actually Canadian partners we work through, yes. Okay. okay, because that's, for us as Canadians, what happens is a lot of software is built, but it's never built for us in Canada, so we can't use it. Example, Inventory Labs. It, since day one, they've never built a version that works in Canada, as a good yeah, our example. Our software doesn't either. <laughs> Sorry, but now I'll yeah. know more about it and I'll see the opportunity and we'll do so. Yeah, so I'll go and I'll start my little presentation here. And if anyone has any questions or wants to ask things as I'm going along, then we'll just, uh, right. we'll just, we'll just do it. Let's see. And we'll do it like this. Do we need to give okay. him presentation? I don't know. I push, let's see if it works. It's maybe I have okay. to uh, let's click the share button. Yes. Um, yeah, I did oh, it. Perfect. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So e-commerce. This presentation is about e-commerce in Canada, and we're today we're doing a little bit about Amazon, and we're going to do. We can talk about other things as well, and I put a link to this presentation in the there. You can always download it later. It's a as a PDF right now. The presentation done in PowerPoint, but I didn't want to start it up because then I lose everyone's faces if I run PowerPoint because it's only two screens. So a little bit about me. I started Amazon selling in 2015. My first flip ever was Home Depot. I bought um, a Milwaukee M12 kit for $50. And I bought over 50 of them. And they were clearing them out at Home Depot for $50, regular 200. But that model was going out of stock or being discontinued for some reason. So I ended up selling those within like two weeks on amazon.ca and they were selling the hotcakes for like 150 bucks. And then there was some fees of course, but it was my first real flip and got me kind of into it. I have personally helped build some prep centers and in Edmonton and I've worked with uh, one in the US to help them grow and figure out how they were gonna do their work. I focus right now on helping small businesses grow and expand their e-commerce business, whether Shopify, Amazon, other third-party things as well. I also help people automate their tasks. So if there's something that you're doing every day over and over again, let's say you're clicking this button, doing that, doing that, that's I help people with that as well. And right now I run, I'm the uh, operations manager at Alberta Prep. I'm also running a service which is basically bringing groceries from Canada to the US. And if you do that, you need to tell the US government to say, hey, I'm bringing this across the border, the FDA, and be like, I'm bringing this item across the border. This is where it was manufactured. So if there's ever like a recall at a plant or something, they can know where bad food came into the US. Okay. And then I, your e-com help is not really a, um, it's not really a big website. I'm just opening up the chat here in case there's questions that I need to answer. Uh, so yeah, that's just, that's just kind of a, uh, your e-com help is not launched yet, but it's kind of gonna be my main source of things. So yes. like, I was ask, like I was asking, so how many people here besides like the trade agreements or anything have, have sold something in Canada on a marketplace in Canada 
and shipped it from Canada, for example. Does anyone here, have anyone done that? No. no. Tim says no. 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 Okay. So the topics we'll cover today, and we can cover more beyond this, is what can you expect in selling on Amazon Canada? What are the costs of exporting from Canada to the US? And can I buy goods in Canada to sell in Canada? So as a US citizen, can I buy goods, or if you're from Europe or wherever, that you can sell in Canada, okay? So what can you expect in Amazon Canada? So if you're seeing those listings in the US where there's like 60 sellers, that doesn't happen in Canada. Generally, you're gonna get a higher ROI but you're gonna have lower sales. Think of, think of Canada as like your sales in California, basically. You're gonna have 10 times, more sa 10 times less sales in Canada than the US. But, but if you have a private label product in certain areas, for example, like my friend, when the Instapot first came out, she had a product in Canada that was selling 50 times what it was selling in the US because there was no competition on this certain like Instapot lid or whatever was the, the hip Instapot thing at the time, if that makes sense. She was outselling her US store so much because she had, we'll say 20 competitors in the US and in Canada, she had one and they had horrible pictures, horrible. It was mm. like, it was just like somebody brought their stuff in from the US, didn't spend just took the listings as is didn't change the listings a little bit to make them, you know, just more Canadianized and fill in, like mm -hmm. change the words. Like we do have some changes in our words. Right. And one of the rules in Amazon Canada that you guys need to be aware of is if I'm selling something in Canada, it has to be multilingual. Okay. So you have to have a French label and a an English label as well. And what a lot of people are doing is they're taking, going to Google Translate and just translating what they have in the package and putting an extra sticker on. Stuff that you buy in Canada already, you don't have to do that. But when you're coming from the US, you have to put that extra French sticker on. And that's sufficient okay. to just put a sticker on in French, whatever yeah. you have in, and what kind of information has to be on there in French? So let's say you're, if, if you're a food product, you, everything in French, you're just redoing the label that, you know, the writing part that you have on the label, you're basically redoing it in, you're translating the English to the French, like the ingredients or the warnings mm -hmm. or how to do it, instructions, just the basic under, things about the thing. Yeah. It can all be done in Google and it's not hard to do. And like I do, like one of the things I do is I print off like one of the clients I work with, we use a four by six sticker that you can get like a, like a shipping sticker. We cut it in half or thirds and we print all the information on there and that, then you just have it. Nice. And you just, then you have three stickers and it's quick and easy. Has anyone ever put an extra sticker on a product that they've shipped to Amazon to meet requirements in a country? I'm not saying Canada, but maybe the US or wherever. Yes. So what, why did you have to do well, that? Well, I have to put expiration stickers on all of our food, which is above and beyond. You know, it could be on the food that we sell, but you know, we need to add that extra expiration sticker um, or we put on like single unit or something like that if it's a boxed item. So above and beyond just the F and SKU. Yeah, and also we have, I used to sell this item from Denmark and I had to put English on it mm -hmm. because nobody could read it. So I had an English and French sticker that I put on the product and I used the four by six and I cut it in half and the top part was English, top part was French. And it was, that's how I got around those limitations. Nice. And then people could understand what it was. So the rules in Amazon are very similar in Canada to the US. Um, the date, the expiry date needs to be at a certain point based on the size of, it, may, it has to be human readable. That's what the, that's what I think the language is in Canada. It has to be human readable. That's easily readable. So especially on beauty products that have a lot number, you have to make sure that there is the expiry date on those mm -hmm. and that you're translating those. And I'm sure you're doing those in the U.S. already. Is that um, the date transfer um, 
French D or is it the same as an American? You can just you can just write you can just write like exp date you can just write date and that you don't have to translate to French. Well, I mean, like, do you have to That's, write like to um, in France the, the it's day month year in the United States it's month day year. Do you need to do that? I mean, I've gotten around that confusion by just writing out the month and saying February. Yeah, yeah, I I can't remember off the top of my head what the requirements are, but usually I just do the three letter month. And then the the day and the year, like in full. And then that usually works enough for any country. Okay. So I write like to, it would be like J U N zero eight mm -hmm. and then 2021. And that usually covers any country's requirements because I don't like it when it's like zero two, zero four, two thousand like you don't know for which sure which one is it is. Year. Yeah. It, I mean which month which one is the day, like, which is the month, right? Yeah, and you don't know, and it's sometimes a guess, and I don't like guessing, so I try to make it easy. And yeah, we just print out, like if I'm doing expired product, we print it out on like the same thing we're printing out FN SKU and just put it on the product. Does anyone have any questions so far? Give everyone a second to see if anyone has it. So, uh, Fernando said, only from USA to Canada through FBA. So you're using probably the NAFTA or the Global Export Program. And when that first started, it was very interesting to watch people's stores when it first got turned on a couple of years ago to where it was going. Because I saw people out of the US ship to Japan, to like Ireland, and it was crazy to see how far you could ship your products and Amazon would cover that stuff. Okay, so we'll go on to the next one. So what a lot of, so, what a lot of Canadian sellers do is they sell both in Canada or they ship unique Canadian goods to the U.S. So what happens is we have certain goods that are made in Canada that you don't have in the U.S. So we are allowed to, Canadians are allowed to ship over the border a box of $800 of value using the 321 duty-free rule into the U.S. Mm. You guys shipping into Canada are required to pay GST and more on the shipment and it depends what the shipment is to where you pay, if that makes sense. So it's not as clear and it's not as easy to figure out with your uh, duties. It's, it's, it's not easy. I can't always figure it out. And I, I've done quite a bit of it and I can never always be sure how much they're gonna charge me for duties at the border. Mm. Because it, it's, there's no set like way that they charge. And sometimes they're like, this item's from China, they're gonna charge you more and like it's you just never know for sure okay that's why if you're going to buy for canada i suggest that you work with a wholesaler that has an affiliation with one in canada and that you try to buy canadian for canadian mm -hmm. and then get started with that and then once you you'll you'll see that it's the exact same rules very similar as the us or europe or whatever you're in and then you can try to play with the border crossings and learn how that works I don't, it's a little harder to ship food into Canada because there's a little extra paperwork that's involved, but other items is not as bad, okay? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us, what we do is, if I'm shipping to the US right now from Canada and selling on amazon.com, I will use a freight forwarder which will walk my box from Edmonton or Toronto and it walks across the border and then we use local US rates to ship our boxes around. So we're not paying like, you know, that expensive shipping. We're using like your $19 a box to ship it around, mm. okay? So that's one way that you guys, if you choose to, could buy Canadian products and ship it across the border. When I started USA prior notice, we did this because the US government asked me to like say, I bought a box of Kraft Dinner, I'm sending it to Joe at here or I'm sending it to Amazon, they want to know because if let's say that Kraft Dinner comes out with an outbreak of some disease, mm. they can trace back where it came in and be like shutting down that shipments from that factory or flagging them as they come across the border. Because when you're creating an FDA prior notice, you got to say, listen, I'm sending this box across the border at Detroit port 0901 at this time. And this is what it contains. So let's see you, so it helps them stop the spread of anything that comes wrong, okay? So this slide here, every product on this page is made in Canada. 
So does anyone recognize any of the products on this page? It may be hard to read. I don't know. Right? How many in the chat that one. you recognize? I got one. We'll see. How many do you, Tim and, okay, you recognize the hemp. One, one, two. Yes. Okay. So Nestle is a chocolate company in Canada. You have Nestle in the U.S. You have some, but you don't have the same bars. Old Dutch you have in the U.S., right? But you have different kinds, I think, right? We have pretzel. I don't think we have ketchup. Oh, no, you, you won't have the ketchup flavor. You're going to have like original. Oh, those are pretzels. Right? Okay, I didn't realize that. Yes. Oh, those are chips. No, the, these, are, these are potato chips. Okay. These are potato Except chips. You guys here. don't have ketchup chips in the U.S. Okay. And then we have our we have our fake cheese that says it's made with real cheese, cheese whiz, <laughs> and the hubba bubba's from Canada. And then we have one of our favorite famous things that's like a coffee syrup to make your Java drinks. And then we have candy, which is fuzzy peaches, and then Starburst. You guys got Starburst in the US. I don't know how that made the list. <laughs> because you guys got lots of Starburst in the US. I don't know for sure if organic hemp hearts. It says it's made in the U.S., but it could also be made in 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 U.S. and like there could be a version of some of these items made in the U.S. as well. Hmm. So, you can search, and if you search Amazon for imported from Canada, you're going to find thousands and thousands of products to come across. So, the one thing to know is like, I can tell you some of the costs of some of this. Like, this box of chips is like three dollars in Canada. But I don't recommend sending this to Amazon because it has, a, you know, that window of expiry. You're supposed to be like 105 days you're supposed to send stuff in. Mm -hmm. Chips don't have that. No. Chips have like a 90-day window. So I would never send that in. But for some reason, you can see on the screen, there's lots of people FBAing that. So, yeah. And like those fuzzy peaches at the bottom, that pack is worth like, those are worth like $4. And all you have to do is get it to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and you can make fourteen twenty-eight plus you have to minus your fees. Right. And if you can get it there, you can make money. You just have to make sure it's not meltable right now. I don't think they're meltable, but they, except they for gummies? the Nestle favorites, I guarantee you. Yeah, they're like a gummy bear, but some of the Mayard stuff is classified as, gum, as meltable. Some of it's not. But if you're going to err on the side of caution, you can always wait till October to send them in anywhere, September right. when they reopen. But I guarantee the Nestle favorites up here, that's pure chocolate. Okay, that's pure chocolate. So we sent, so after the deadline, we did some merchant fulfilling for some of our clients. We sent chocolate across the border. By the time it got to their place, even putting it in like a, a cold bag and everything, they still melted. Mm -hmm. So then we had to stop because it wasn't going to be profitable. So that's one of the reasons that Amazon stopped selling is because we all know that the postage service, you know, temperatures aren't regulated. And it's the same thing in Canada. We have a stop for selling multiples for the exact same reason. So how many, so you guys know about these goods. How many have you actually eaten from this, this eight, this, this thing of eight, put it in the chat. Let's see how many of these have you tried from the eight. The Nestle pack has Smarties, Coffee Crisp, and arrow bar. I know it's hard to see the little picture. Let's give everyone a second to see. Two. Hemp hearts. I've never tried them. Three. Three. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yep. Yeah. So the Java coffee is $5 a bottle in Canada. So they're not making much on this sending across the border because it's selling for six seventeen fifty for two. It's not really worth exporting to the U S because there's too many sellers and the prices went down, but that is an interesting product. If you want to try something in like, it's a really good product. I would say it's like a sugary drink. People love that. So a lot of that. Okay. So, can you, guy, can you buy goods in Canada to sell in Canada? Yes, you can use it. You can send it direct if you talk to them and get the labels on the boxes, or you can use prep centers just like you do in the US or Europe. We have all, we have big retailers like Walmart. We have Toys R Us that's still alive in Canada. And you'll find there's a bunch of Toys R Us toys that you're finding. Why are these still on Amazon? 
it's because us Canadians are still mm -hmm. sending them down or you've got a couple of stores that are popping up here and there. We have Costco. We have like a superstore, which is a London, like is basically a Walmart. We have a London drugs. We have more. Most people will sell in Canada FBA. We won't do merchant fulfilled for two reasons. Number one is high shipping costs. Because what happens is we start shipping. Our shipping costs start at around eight to twelve dollars Canadian and go up. It's not like the five dollar, you know, first class that you guys get in the U.S. It's like ten dollars here. It's expensive. It's very expensive to ship stuff. So that's why people will do an FBA box. So if you're looking at the cost difference between the U.S. and Canada without the dollar exchange. Our shipping is about 25% higher on FBA, okay, on average. If you get bigger shipments, it becomes a little less. Or if you have less shipments, it's more. But usually around 25%. So, like, if you're shipping a box across from your place to Amazon and it's, like, $18 US, that box in Canada might be around 22 Canadian, okay? One of the biggest reasons we sell from Canada to the US, for example, too, is we have the exchange. So right now the exchange is not as good as it used to be, but like we make 15% on the exchange when we exchange our, our money right now. So if we're selling something for $18 US, that's worth a lot more Canadian once you minus out your costs. Okay. Hmm. I personally now over a hundred Canadian sellers that are selling at least 10 K a month in Amazon sales, just selling replenishables or selling, you know, from wholesaler, stuff like that, it's very doable. It's very doable. And there's a lot less competition up here. And as long as you, yeah, and there's, yeah, there's a lot less competition. One note to note though, is once you reach 30,000 in sales, you must apply for a GST number. This is fairly simple. You just, you just go to the government and say, I'm selling in Canada. They're going to give you a GST number. It can be done over the phone or done on a website. And basically then you just charge You'll already be, if you're buying in Canada, you're going to pay the 5%. And by having a GST number, it helps you recover some of that money. Okay. One of the advantages that Canadian sellers have for selling in the U.S. is if I buy $10,000 worth of goods and I've paid $500 in taxes, I ship it over the border, I can go to the Canadian government and get that $500 back in tax credits because I'm not sending it to the ultimate end customer, if that makes sense. So we can recover the GST on our purchases for stuff that we're shipping to the U.S. So that's one of the reasons you'll see a lot of Canadians south of the U.S. is because what happens is we have regional items and so do you guys in the U.S. And you got, there's different regions of the country looking for things. Like we have sardines that are made out west, out east. People that live in Alberta or Manitoba or something, they can't get that home product at the store, so they go to Amazon buy their sardines. Or there's a certain kind of mustard that you get out east, you can't get in your store, they go to Amazon, pay more, but they still get their mustard. So a lot of Amazon sales in Canada are for interesting items like that are because people want a taste of home and they can't get it at the local store because they're regional items. And like there's a lot of stuff like that in Canada. Okay. Tim wants to ask a question in the chat. $30,000. When you hit your first 30,000, you have to apply for it. It doesn't matter if it takes you five years or 10 years. It's when you hit 30,000, you're supposed to apply for a GST number. Then you're supposed to use it going forward after that. It's even for us Canadians have the same rule. And this, you have to that, remit to them, your... remit sales tax to them, um, Monthly or quarterly or? You can choose. So you get to choose. We have the option of monthly, quarterly, I think every two months. It all depends. Like it depends on what you're doing with the GST. But I would say when you're first starting out, do it like every quarter because then at least you're staying on top of it. Us sellers that and are Amazon sending from do it Canada. For you, right? So you'll select your tax settings on Amazon. And what will happen is they'll collect the U.S. and send you a tax invoice. Like the, you know how this, you know, in the U.S. how they have certain states that you're collecting tax for, mm -hmm. like Denver or something. The, um, Canada does the same thing for you. You don't have to do any of it. You just have to say that I'm selling. Here's my GST number. They're going to collect the right okay. taxes in all the countries for you, and then you just submit it with an accountant. 
and then you're going to get your rebate or you're going to owe a little bit. Like if you buy goods in Canada and you sell in Canada, you might end up owing because your GST on a dollar item is five cents. If you sell that item for $10 mm-hmm. and you collect that, that 50 cents in tax, you owe the Canadian government 45 cents, if that makes sense. And that'll be part of your numbers because you collected 45 cents and you only paid five. So you got to give them the difference. If that makes sense. Right, which is why you want to keep track of your, your um, what you do yeah. put out in GST. Yeah, and Amazon's going to give you a report every month, and it's the same thing. You can download it. They're going to give you a cost per area. Like in some regions, they charge you more sales tax, and they're going to say in Ontario, it's I think it's thirteen percent or something or twelve. I can't remember off the top of my head, but like they charge you in different regions different taxes. But it'll all you'll be able to work with it. Amazon will give you all the data you need. Okay. And they're charging it to the end customer just because I know there's a couple of people here that um, haven't started selling on uh, Amazon yet, let alone Canadian. And um, yeah, so it's, you're charging the customers paying it and then you're remitting that just like washing it right yes. through to the government. Yes. Yeah. So basically I sell an item for $10. You selected GST goods available on that item that you're going to receive from the customer 1050. We'll say, you, you're going to be paid the GST and then you've got to pay it back to the government. Mm-hmm. It's not like Amazon keeps it for you. Like, yeah. So, but then you're going to have, then let's say you had an, okay, we're going to say we're sell a $10 item and we had, we sold it to Alberta. So it's 5%. So you made 50, you get 50 cents. And then it was shipped from Calgary and there was an FBA fee of like $3. And then you have to pay 5 cent tax on that. So, Technically, it would be 65 cents in tax, if that makes sense, because you'd have they're going to charge you that three dollars and they're going to charge you tax on the fulfillment as well per wherever it comes from, if that makes sense. I'm confused. Does that happen to you guys in the U.S.? So if you so in Canada, if I ship something from the warehouse in Calgary Mm -hmm. to someone in in Calgary, the fulfillment center will charge me tax on their services that they provide. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? So that's sometimes a difference. They don't always do that in the U.S. That's what yeah, we I do don't in Canada. think that they do. So I don't think we have a, on that, but I don't think we have to pay for the service what, what, taxes on that. Not yet. Probably soon. Yeah. So it, but we're, but usually what happens in Canada is you're going to see in your Amazon account it's a three dollar and fifteen cent fee, and then when you get your tax receipt, it's going to say that you paid fifteen cents. Mm. It's not going to like. It's not going to not it's just going to take it out automatically and then you're going to know it later okay like you get to know it later Mm. right okay so the biggest thing about canada if you're doing ebay or whatever you want to do there's usually less sellers higher rois but slower movement in your money so if you're but so i suggest that sellers buy less off the bat and try to feel out the market before they go too crazy it's fairly easy to start in Canada. There's not much barriers. You can send it, you can like you can just click on the Canada flag today. And if you buy in Canada and send to Canada, you can do that. Or you can learn how to ship from the US to Canada. There's not much barriers. Like it's not like you have to learn how to do VAT or anything mm-hmm. like that. You just gotta just learn to how to do the GST and a sim- accountant that knows either Canada market or the US should be able to help you. And we are a highly underserved e-commerce market, okay? Mm. So like I said, like that person at the Instapot item, there was only two sellers on that Instapot lid where there was 50 in the US at the same time. They were making mad bank in Canada and they were making much more money than the US because it was cutthroat. They were down to like $3 a profit a unit in Canada. They were making like 10, 12, 15 because there was no competition. So it made it easy. We have the same options for you guys that work well with you, Barbara, and gift options as well, where you can add a gift bag and charge a little extra for that if you're merchant fulfilling, but many people don't do it because of the shipping costs. Mm -hmm. But we do have that option. So you say it's- So does uh, anyone have any questions? I have someone ready. Go ahead. So the um, writing down things. So one of the things um, getting started in the U.S. now is very difficult because you have you have to get your account approved, 
which is a level of difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, you have to prove that you are who you are. They're doing postcards. They're doing all these things to authenticate people. Um, then you have to get approved in the category. Then you have to get approved in the brand. Then you have to get, you know, um, how does that work in the category? How is that working in Canada? Like, is it as severe as it is in the United States on .com? So we have the same category blocks. Like everyone's gated in topicals to start. Mm -hmm. And everyone, it's, it's similar blocks. But one of the good things is, any any way that you got so any way that you got engaged in the US, you can use the same invoices for Canada. Okay. okay. That's good. So, um, so if you got engaged a certain that. way. No, it's you just basically have to redo what you did in the US and you have to be within the time frame, right? You have to be within six months or three months, whatever the gating says. It's usually six months, but usually as long as you're there and you have your address, so that you'd use your address that you use in the US, right? So you would have the same address as you do on your invoice and it's the same process, takes the same hurdles, the same headaches, but you can use those invoices to get you started and get you ungated. Yep. Um, is there any, I know that the compliance issues seem to be different than they are in the US. Um, we are basically flat out not able to sell a lot of our toys on the NAFTA, um, where they're okay in Mexico, obviously they're okay in the US, but like they're, basically aren't taking uh, a lot of items is, is, is it, and I heard it was stricter in Canada, the compliance than it is in the States. We have a lot of people. I see a lot of people getting hit with claims and they're just trying to make sure that the goods are, I don't know. There's not really an organization in Canada that's like stopping them, but Amazon for some reason is mm -hmm. being like, they want to make sure everything's safe. Right. They're asking for paperwork left, right, and center. I see it on both the U.S. and Canada. They're getting hit the same day mm -hmm. on the same products. So they'll be like, there'll be that toy that they're asking Canada sellers. They're asking across the board. I don't, I don't like. I haven't only sold a little bit on NAFTA, and I don't know every nick and cranny because the program is always slightly changing a little bit, but. I know that you, if an Asian gets hit in the U.S., it doesn't necessarily get hit in Canada right away. Sometimes it takes a while or it gets hit the same day. It, it's, it's very unpredictable. But there is a lot of what sellers that it? sell toys. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. There are a lot of sellers that sell toys, right? There, th yeah, um, there's a lot of sellers that sell toys in Canada. Yeah, so I'm going to see, I, I need to actually, so when I last looked at it, there were a lot of people drop shipping. Um, and I'm now wondering with all the compliance, if a lot of those people have fallen off. So I should go take a look at that because that might be really interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the, some of the listings where it has, you know, some of the listings that are like $79. What's happening is that's the U S listing that they have stock that they've enabled NAFTA to go across the border. That's why it's so high, right? And that's including all the, yeah. you know, the custom fees and all that stuff. That's why it's so high. And it, it won't, it'll, it'll say fulfillment. It doesn't say fulfillment by, like it doesn't say fulfillment by Amazon, like on the listing, but it is fulfillment by Amazon, if that makes sense. Like it's just gonna show right. that Amazon's sending you the item, but it's not prime. Sorry, it's fulfilled by Amazon, but it's not prime. That's what it'll say mm -hmm. on the listing. So for some of the Canada oh, listings. Okay. I can pull some sense. up we later and we can look the at them. <laughs> Where it says prime, yeah. but it's not. But by the time it gets a leak, yeah, it's it'll prime. say fulfilled by Am yeah. yeah, it says fulfilled by Amazon, but it's like a weird day. You're like, why does this take two weeks to get here? And it's not from, it, it's mm -hmm. because they're bringing it in from another country. Um, what was your storage issue a few months ago? Like the, the, the warehouse store, is that, is that, oh. Will so right now, that? oh yeah, oh yeah. Like, like, so I work with a seller. He usually has on inventory at hand a thousand at a time, minimum units across, mm -hmm. we'll say 15 SKUs. He's limited to like 300 right now. So he can't send any in. We haven't been able to send any in because he sells about 200 a month, but he liked what we were expanding his store so he could have more SKUs and putting in enough inventory mm -hmm. to last like two, one to three months, depending on how 
the advertising went. I'll put that in quotation marks, advertising. So then mm-hmm. we got hit by the, by the blockage and he's down to 300. Some people are down to 200. Usually 200 is the, low, the lowest that people have. And it's still going on today because what happened is we had, so in terms, if you're looking and comparing to the U.S., we had about 50% of our, our fulfillment centers closed. So that why? killed the whole network. That's why they had to shut it down. Because Ontario closing? had like two or th- COVID. Ontario. Mm, they had mm. issues. Wow. So Ontario. Well, that kind of makes this Ontario, I guess. Yeah. So Ontario has. Ontario right now is shipping roughly 30 to 50% of the e-commerce goods in Canada. Then we have fulfillment centers in other places, but they were a giant hub and they have like, you know, it's kind of like Juliet where they have MDW one all the way up to MDW seven. That's the way Ontario Mm -hmm. is. And then a bunch got hit and the government closed a bunch of stuff. And then the health orders closed a bunch more. So it was like, but it's, it should be when people ask me what's happening and based on what we see in Canada, it looks like, July 15th or sooner, we're going to start to get back to normal. So because That's most good. of the places are like, like Alberta is kind of closing, opening up more this week and next week and other provinces are doing the same. So I'm predicting the 15th of July, just because that is a realistic date that should be like the max that will have a lot more levels going up. And also our fulfillment centers had a lot of products and we don't have many of them, if that makes sense. They were very full. Okay. Like our, our, yeah, like we get a lot of pro. Like we don't have enough fulfillment centers for Canada, and you got to think we're a country that's spread from like Timbuktu all the way to the, like it's a big country, and there's not as many. Like the fulfillment center density isn't as good. Right, right. And there, there's the, the population like isn't as dense as the states, but no, yeah, no. Like like Alberta is around four or five million people. And 2019, we finally got a fulfillment center in Alberta. <laughs> Before that, we were getting shipped stuff from the province beside us, so BC, or we were getting shipped all the way from Ontario, which is like one four provinces over to us. Yeah. So it's it's a long it was a long distance. So then they opened up uh, standard goods in Calgary, and then last year they opened up oversized in Edmonton and the one in Edmonton also serves as a hub for the stuff coming up from Calgary to feed the Northern Alberta market, if that makes sense. So they, they'll bring up all the standard goods, excuse me, from Calgary, and then they'll distribute out just like they do in the U S same thing. They'll do the FC transfer up and then they're going to, when they sell the item and then they ship it up, it's one day from Edmonton to Calgary. And then it goes out to the customer. And that's how they decide to work in Canada. So quick question. Ah, Fernando's going to have a question. A quick question before we go. So last year in March, they shut down all our fulfillment centers except for essential goods. Did that happen in Canada? I mean, obviously a lot of Canadian sellers in the U.S. So this is like what we did last year for you this year. This is your, your you know, we're yeah. pretty normal now, but it sounds like you guys entered the uh, FBA health. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's good that that's the reason. So we had so. that. We had. I mean, it's bad. But it's- we had that for. Yeah, we had that for about a month and a half. Where they were, what they would do is they they uh, they change the shipping times two weeks up. So if I tried to order a computer mouse on the fourteenth, it would show that it would arrive on like next month. Yeah. If that that's makes sense. That's all they did. They just pushed the shipping times up and it only lasted less than a month. It wasn't that long. And what most people would do is they'd go down the list. Okay. And let's say that there, so if I was buying a mom mouse mm-hmm. and it go down the list and the first one's 14 days, then the next one's two days. It means that one was in Alberta already. And I could order that one and they'd ship it up. If it's just, they were stopping like, transfers from like Ontario to Canada to Alberta then to the customer okay. if it was already in our region it was still two days shipping. just yeah. clearing they, out the they did a lot they, they stopped sending anything and then they finally figured out that they could open up merchant they said all right you can merchant fulfill and I'm like yeah but there's a buy box issue because FBA has a buy box we won't ship for you know four weeks so it's very frustrating 
Um, for, Fernando has a question yeah. in the chat about oh, the OA, how viable the OA model is in Canada. Yes, so OA is alive and well in Canada. It's the same thing. There'll be less sellers and a lot of people are doing it, making a lot of money. So a lot of people are going to smaller Canadian retailers that have interesting items and sending them either to Canada or the US and making a lot of money. It is, it is very viable. And we like Walmart, we, I've owned prep centers and Walmart has never stopped any shipments going to any prep center that I know that I've run. No one's ever ordered too much. We just order like, you know, five, 10 of an item, send it in. And we know Canada's a little slower to sell. So we're only ordering five to 10 and going very wide, just like mm -hmm. I suggest people go in the US. So it works really well. And you just got to make sure like I like I used so when I first started FBA, they used to have this little trick that I used to that used to work really well. And what it was, was if I sold multiple of an item and they shipped it from an FBA warehouse, they would save you on the FBA fees on the second, third, fourth and fifth mm -hmm. item. OK, instead of charging you like three dollars each. That's what my goal was. And that's where I made so much bank because I would sell one item for FBA and make, you know, like $3. And then when I sold two of it, it would be like 15 because it would be like, you'd get all these savings and they'd start to roll and compound really they don't fast. don't do that anymore. In FBA, I hate in, that they, in .com, there's no FBA savings for multi, for multi merchant fulfilled. Yes, but not multi FBA, which is frustrating because I saw a lot of multiples. Yeah. I'm like, you could give us a little break. Yeah. I wish, I wish Amazon would change mm -hmm. that model because a lot of people buy multiples and it would encourage people from, it would encourage people to sell on the single listings instead of making more listings on Amazon too, right? Because a lot of people are making bundles now with multiple items and something else. I and wish they, you know how they have the business the amount thing of done where you can like discount by quantity? Why, why they don't open that up mm -hmm. for consumers where you have to have a business account and it's crazy. I'm like, that would be huge. Um, I have a lot of complaints, but we, yeah, don't, but need we, to, we don't hear, need to hear my complaints tonight. Just, yeah, but we, but they, but they don't give you a discount on the FBA fees. Why don't they give us a discount on that fifteen percent or something else? They could do that because they're already selling the initial item. Maybe they get fifteen percent on the first item, and the rest they don't get as much. If they could hand some of that back, it would encourage people to sell more. Yeah duplicates and, and, and we give discounts on that right? too that would be great and um it would encourage people yeah. to buy more because it would be cheaper to buy six instead of four and it wouldn't have to buy, look for these all these like bundles and stuff and some things you don't bundle in multiples yeah. but someone might want two stuffed animals but you would never make a bundle of two teddy bears it's kind of weird so but on food and soap and yeah, stuff no, yeah I And we have, we have similar, like if you sell a grocery item under $15, it's 8% instead of 15%. We have some similar savings like that in Canada as well, but it's also less profitable to sell that unless you're buying it super cheap, right? right? So that's, that's very similar to Canada. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a lot of people will, so like a lot of people will buy from like Walmart or other smaller vendors and do OA and just do flips nonstop and watch for coupons and sales and stuff. And just, it's the same as the U S except there's less competition. So the best way so is like viable. every other model is to start with RA or OA. If you're Canadian selling on Canada. Yeah, I would start, if I was doing Canada, I would start by going to the grocery store, physically going, scanning, you know, like six, six items in an aisle, going to the next aisle to scan another six and kind of see if there's any spot that Amazon's not filling. Because especially in Canada, there's lots of hidden gaps that they don't mm -hmm. fill. And, and if you see, let's say that you scan a soap and the, the margin isn't there and you see Amazon's on the listing, look at a couple others around there and you might find that maybe there's a bundle of that soap later at home that does well or another variation of that soap that Amazon's not selling that might not have the listing tanked as much in mm -hmm. price or as low. And then you might, you might find items that way. And I'll give you guys an example. Back when I started, I used to sell this um, 
So, you know, for glass mason jars, mm -hmm. they used to have these white plastic lids. I used to sell, when you did the numbers in Jungle Scout, for example, which doesn't, and all these tools, they don't necessarily tell our sales velocity correct because it's, it's like, like this, okay? You could, like that product was supposed to sell 10 a day. Sometimes it sold 100 and just mm -hmm. sold, right? That's, it's, it was crazy that way because it would go like bouncing all around. But I sold a masonry lid that was plastic. I'd buy it for like $3 and I would sell it for like 12 nonstop. And I would make like $3 a unit at the end of the day. And that thing sold like hotcakes, like for so many years in a row. And you just got to find the spot. And then when I was buying that product from that manufacturer, I was buying it from Walmart. I Googled online and I went, I don't know what I remember what the brand name was. Then I Googled online and I found a place that was selling it. Okay. Mm -hmm. They weren't saying they were a wholesaler or anything or anything like that. And then I, and I sent them an email. I'm like, listen, I want to buy a hundred of these. Can I get a deal? They listed on their website for like six something. And I was getting it like four something at Walmart. They're like, sure, we can do this. And they actually came back to me and had a price lower than Walmart, okay. including the shipping to me. So then I bought my first order from them, which was like 200 or whatever. So I got that. Everything went well. So then I went back to them and I said, what else do you have in stock? So they sent me their entire catalog. And even though they weren't a wholesaler or anything, they were willing to give me those prices because I showed them on the first purchase that I was a serious purchaser mm. and they were willing to give me discounts on everything else. So I ended up selling about seven different items from that line for finding that item at Walmart because I went to a distributor, not a wholesaler, as you would say, but it was just a, ra a random distributor in Canada. And they're like, yeah, we'll give you a discount since you're buying in bulk. They're making money. We're making money. It's easier for and them that, to pack and do. That, so, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then what ended up happening was they even opened a location in Edmonton and then it was even cheaper because they weren't shipping it to me anymore. And, sh you know, sh I talked about shipping in Canada. That brought down the cost even more. So that was like that brand for a long time that I sold was crazy. They don't, they don't really exist and sell stuff anymore. They kind of kind of don't sell stuff. But that brand went crazy for a while. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's something that you can use in any country, anywhere. Don't be afraid to, like, find something at Walmart that sells and then go and look online and look for Joe's something, to, so Joe's something and look up where you can buy it. And if they list at $6, don't be afraid to email them and say, what deal can I get if I buy a hundred of these? And then, then after they tell you the price, then ask them what the shipping is. I, I didn't ask them for shipping up front, but I said, how much is this? And I live in Alberta. And then the second email, I told them I live in Alberta. Oh, let's get the shipping quote. And I just got the deal done. It was cheaper than Walmart by like, not, not like crazy much cheaper, the first order. But as I kept ordering, the price went down, 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 down. And then when I ordered like a pallet full at once, it went even cheaper, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's a lesson that I think anyone in any country should do. And that focus on is just find it at Walmart or wherever sells it, then try to find some sort of distributor in the path. Even if they're a small mini store, they might be able to offer you deals, mm -hmm. in, especially if they live in your same hometown and you can go pick it up. And there's, even if they're slightly cheaper than Walmart, it's getting you, then you just, you get more into their catalog and they're going to give you more information. Once you prove to them you're legit, they're going to open up and they'll, they will work hard to make, keep your money because they want to keep that flow coming in. Mm -hmm. That's extra hundreds and hundreds of dollars in money that that business could yeah, have so every month. so easy for them because there's no touching. Like there's no one here, one there, yeah, 10 here. They're just, yeah, it's huge. Yeah, they're just selling it by the case. Like I'm like, so like, I asked for 200 or 100, whatever the first order was. Then I'm like, what is the case pack on this item? The next time I ordered, they told me it was like, I don't know, 72 or whatever. I'm like, let's just keep ordering by the case. So you don't have to open up cases and count it and make it easier for you. Mm -hmm. And we'll order just by the case. And then they were happy. Like you said, they're really happy to work from you when you order the more amounts and you're, yeah, they're more because they just ship the big box to you instead of like picking out right. like and 10 then or 20 or whatever. Smaller, I mean, it's the less they can touch something, the better, the happier they are. 
Um, Chakra has another question. They're, they're making. So if you look at that on the chat. Yeah. What? Is what's the best? Yeah. What so what is? Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. So when you ship something from China, you're going to ship a DDP. You're going to ship it to a third party first, like a prep center or somebody you know, because usually what happens is there might be a hidden fee on that DDP shipment, okay? Like I, whenever I buy something from China, I expect even with DDP shipping, I put in, I calculate at least a $20 thing. So DDP, it what does that stand about, for? Duty, it's supposed to be like a duty paid and everything's supposed to be covered and you're not supposed to pay anything, but there's always a weird DHL fee mm -hmm. or UPS fee or something. It just, it's annoying, but it always happens in Canada. So that's why I say ship it to a third party person first and they can reship it to FBA before okay. you. Because you want, because Amazon will, will receive that box. It'll say, you, Amazon, you owe $20 on the shipment. They're just going to be like, return to sender. <laughs> just be like, we don't want to deal with this. And that's what happens in the US too. Do you have that? Has anyone ever had that in the US that they basically, your your private label brand will go to Amazon and they'll return it or send it back to the port because there's duties owed. Let's see if anyone's ever had that. Yeah, I know somebody. No, not because of duty, but because they, uh, they didn't have the, I think FDA or, you know, it was a toothbrush. So I think you, you need to get some uh, certification for that. So yeah, uh -huh. you couldn't get it in. So when, when you, do you buy anything from China, Barbara? I do, but I have ways to not deal with that. So I use people like, um, I work through other people, so I don't have to do the freight forwarding and all that. So one of the, one of the people I work with is a Chinese American. So he actually acts as the importer. So I don't have to deal with it. Okay. I was just, yeah, I was, I was curious if anyone on the call would, has ordered things DDP in the U S and has faced similar challenges to me in paying random unknown costs that just end up happening. Mm -mm. Just because. I'm sure they do though. I'm a, a friend of mine imported from China and she had paid to have the um, containers cleaned four times. Like it went wow. off one container, cleaning fee, another container, cleaning fee, another container, cleaning fee. I'm like, why didn't you use somebody who does this? Yeah. Cause well, now I know how to do it. I'm like, yeah, I guess. So when I first started FBA in Canada doing private label, I never used containers. I would just do DDP shipping in the air. It costs mm -hmm. more, but I was more reliable and I wouldn't have weird, how can I put it? Charges like that, like for containers and that. Right. I would just pay like three times as much shipping, but I would get the product within like, you know, like two weeks instead of waiting like two months. And that's the way I used to run that business when I ran it is I would do DDP air shipping with like FedEx or mm -hmm. like DHL was DHL. one of my favorite ones. Yeah, it was one of my favorite ones. And there was there was people that did true DDP sometimes and there was other sellers that didn't. And it, it, it I know people that still do it today, but ultimately if you're in the long run in e-commerce in any country, you wanna ship by sea because you're saving that money and you're not throwing it away on shipping costs. You only do emergency shipments by air because okay. if you're running out of if stock. If you have very tiny things that are very light, it kind of makes sense to do it by air, I would think. Yes. Um, if you get one, you know, a thousand units in a box, but if you're shipping anything of size, it's got to go by yes. water. Yes. Although who knows yeah. right now, they might be tied for even with how much the extra fees are. I don't know. Yes, yes. it's a lot. So like I would sell like, I would sell stuff like chakra bracelets or weird little things like that, that ship were fairly small, shipped well. You, we, like I would receive it in Canada. I would rebox it in a nice box, put a nice sticker on the outside, put a little thank you card. And that was one of my private label things I did in Canada. I made it simple instead of, you know, doing it over in China. I made it simpler on the suppliers because there was like, 
I don't know, like 40 people selling it at once instead of trying to get the box done up. I did it all over here. That was just for me. Mm. I found it simpler than designing, sending it over here for that small little item. But people that are really doing FBA, get it all designed over there, do it all up, make it all like nice mm. packaging, right? Yeah. My little my little chakra bracelets when they were when they were still really I, I don't know if you call them hot, but they used to sell really well. And it was like a $2 buy cost shipped to me. And then we'd put on like a $2 box and they'd sell for like $15. And mm-hmm. it was good. And there's still lots of stuff like that you can do, but a lot of bigger whales are in both marketplaces now. Yeah, you need to do your research for sure. Yeah. So. I hope that answers for, so FBA, I recommend bring it to a third party first before you send to Amazon in case there's any hidden fees so it doesn't go back to China, okay? So like at our prep center, for example, we charge 50 per box to forward to Amazon. So you would send us the labels, we would receive it, we'll put the labels on the box, put the labels on a pallet if you want. You would then pay, you know, like Canadian prices for shipping, whatever you want. That's kind of what we do for that as a service for people because a lot of private label sellers just want to make sure it gets through and the boxes aren't damaged before it goes to FBA or doesn't Mm -hmm. get sent back to China, which could take, like I have a seller Mm -hmm. that has something. So we charge 250 per box Canadian to forward it to Amazon for our customers. So that would be like, you have a case pack box that we would do, or maybe you have half a case pack box. We'll send it into Amazon we do for our customers okay and then you have to pay canadian shipping on top of that through amazon or by the box or by the pallet in canada is that a little we don't discounted always... ken is the canadian shipping the amazon's version of canadian shipping cheaper than what you could go to yes. the postal oh it's much like cheaper the US. it's so That's yeah it's it's no, it's not this because your shipping is cheaper in the u.s but our Amazon shipping in Canada is only about 25% more like kind of on basis than the U S. But if I ship mm-hmm. that like UPS right to it, I'd pay like double or triple. Okay. Mm-hmm. It'd be like, okay. if I'm paying like 22, it'd be like $40 a box. Or like if mm-hmm. I did Canada post, it'd be like $60 a box. It's, it's, it's like way out there and it's not any faster with those rates, but it's like way out there. So yeah, yeah. that's yeah. And so, one of the reasons we opened up, we, I, in the last couple, we just opened up the prep center a little while ago because of all the issues Canadian sellers are having. They can only send in like 200 at a time or they have to store some for a couple months before it goes to Amazon. That's kind of why center. we, that's kind of why we reopened to help some of the private label sellers that were contacting me like daily. And so that's why we, I reopened it after spending some time home with the kids for a while. And then that's how we're doing our model. And there's some people doing OA and stuff, but it's it's mostly private label sellers that just need storage because of the storage limits in Canada. Uh, for OA sellers, what's the average prepping fee for a standard uh, item? Yeah, so in Canada, you're paying between um, $1, we'll say, to $2 for standard items. And you're paying between a dollar fifty to like four fifty for bundles. That's the average price across prep centers in Canada. We charge a dollar mm-hmm. per item to put the label on, and we don't charge for the outbound box. And we send it to Amazon unless you have like send me like oversized items up the yin yang. Then we'll have to charge you for boxes. But um, yeah, we charge a dollar per item for prep. A lot of other places in Canada charge that same amount or a little bit higher. It depends. Some places off you volume discounts. We don't care if you're sending us two items, one item. It doesn't matter to us. We sign you up the same way and treat you the exact same. Because we know that once sellers, even smaller sellers that sell in Canada, and then they see the margins or they just want to do small business, that's fine. There's a lot of places in Canada that won't work with small sellers. And we don't mind working with small sellers because I know I've seen small sellers grow over the years to become much bigger once they get more comfortable with the models. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. I and mean, you got Thank a you. test, right? Sorry, Fernando, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, like we had, so 
when I started my first prep center in Canada back in 2018, we had a guy that went, he sold his first month from, he sold before us, he was selling around $500 a month. He came in and talked to me. He's like, listen, I want to sell more on Amazon. I'm just not very good at the prep. I'm not very good at, you know, some of the research and stuff. Can you sit down with me for one hour a week on the research? And can you help me understand the prep better so I can do it? So then we started off the first month. We went through the hour or two a week. We went through how you would find comparable items that were selling at the retailers he was always buying from, how to choose prep materials. And eventually he's like, he's like, listen, I don't want to do any more prep. You got all the stuff there. I'm just going to come and bring carloads. So then he went from selling 500 a month to thousands a month and thousands and thousands. And then he started exporting to the U S and he just kept growing from there. And eventually he grew big enough that he didn't want my services anymore. He went and got his own staff because wow. he was, he was feeling confident enough that he could hire one person beside him to do all the prep. And then his costs would be cheaper because let's, let's be honest. You can prep for cheaper yourself. Once you hit a certain velocity and you have the warehouse, you can prep cheaper yourself mm -hmm. to do it. So that's what ultimately, if you could become a big seller in the long run, if you want to make more money, you do the prep yourself. It's going to lower the costs, but you also have a lot more fixed costs than too. I know there's a couple of sellers I know. They would never get a warehouse in their life. They just love selling the prep centers because it's hands off. They just keep mm -hmm. doing all the work for them and then they send it in. They just send over the items. They say, I'm sending you five chocolate bars, send it to this agent. They know how much it costs and they just keep researching for more and more products to go nice and wide. I think that's what we're around. Well, I don't know what's a couple things happening in our business, but um, our goal is in the next two years to be hands off. So I have one vendor that'll hold and ship for me. I'm going to get a 3PL for some other stuff. If it doesn't fit the model, probably get rid of it. Um, because I would like to do, I would like to have somebody working remotely and I would like to be able to say, uh, um, dial in from Italy and say, how's it going? What are, where are we at? And not have to deal with all this touching. Um, but it's the mm -hmm. dream. Getting there is going to be challenging. Barbara. I thought that happened on year one after starting selling on Amazon. What? I thought that was, uh, you know, that was the roadmap uh, after one year of selling on Amazon to be working from anywhere in the world and, you know, <laughs> be completely hands off. I guess it's not like that. Yes, it's, um, it's, that's what they say, right? You don't need four hours of work a week. You can be a millionaire. And, um, you know, and I had to tell a few people, I'm like, this is a job. This is work. It's, it's, um, to be successful, I think it's work. So yeah, to to yeah. do as a hobby, you can do easy. Yeah, I would I would love yeah. to be there. That's not gonna so, happen for a while. I had to do too much scrounging. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of what I'm trying to say in today's call is the hustle you're doing in the US, anyone, you can do the same hustle in Canadian once you decide on prep centers and figure out how you're gonna outsource some of that work. You can mm -hmm. do the same hustle that you're doing in the U S and Canada. And it doesn't like, yes, you have the conversion. Yes. You're going to learn a little bit, but to be able to sell more and have more, like the biggest thing is when we're selling stuff in the U S the more stuff you have for sale, the more chance you have for sales. So right. I highly suggest that if you're only selling the U S or Europe, that you just try Canada out even small and just learn it and like it, you're already paying for it. You're not paying any extra to sell in Canada. Let's get that straight here. You're just clicking on the Canada flag because you're already paying the $40 in the US or if you signed up in Canada, you may. So this is a little interesting. This is another interesting tidbit. If I sign up in Canada, I paid $30 Canadian for my account per month. Oh. But I don't have access to certain APIs eventually that, that you might need. If you sign up in the U.S., it's how much? Forty. $39.99. dollars U.S. Yeah, so it's U.S. So that's what a lot of can. And yeah, so that's it. But there is some disadvantages for Canada. We we don't ever get loans. 
So you know how you get, you might get like our loan requests in the US? I've never seen one in Canada, ever. Oh. And I've owned corporations and different things. We don't get loan offers from Amazon. That's one big difference that happens that doesn't credit, happen in so, Canada. So that's going to be interesting too. Doesn't, it doesn't happen in Canada. It happens a lot. If I owned a US corporation and sold in the US, I would have, a, I, I guarantee within like a year, they're going to be a loan available. It always happens mm -hmm. with every one of my clients that I've seen. There's always loans, but it never happens in Canada. And if you have a Canadian corporation and you're listing that you're doing business in the U.S., you'll never get a loan either. doesn't matter how much you sell. You never get an offer. They only mm -hmm. offer it to like U.S. businesses for U.S. loans. I'm not sure why. It must be something to do with topic, the legalities. But... Um. So yeah, we're, we're a little over our time. Help. So I want to just say, how can people reach you? Get in touch with you. I think it's our last slide. We will. There you go. <laughs> so you have our, my, that's our, that's the, that's my email for, that's my email. That's my time. That's my number. They're also the link for the thing. I'll put it in the chat here for, I don't know if I can copy and paste this. Let's see. Yes, nice. I can. I'll put it in the chat as well if you want to download it. And one other thing I want to say is in any business that you do, you have to take a, a, let's take five minutes out each week and make sure that you're improving some sort of task that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very important because that's what I do every week is I, I go back and I look at things. And I'm like, is there some way that I can improve a sourcing task or paperwork task? Can I like make the printer print better, like figure something out and just, mm -hmm. just nip away at things. And you're going to find that by the end of the year, you're going to have a lot more free time. That's a very right? good idea. In your business, spend five minutes a week, try to delegate, improve or improve. Like I say, yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with us. This was very eye opening. And now my head's spinning a little bit on how I'm going to get stuck to Canada. Yeah. Talk, we yeah. Need to I, talk. <laughs> I highly recommend that if you have a vendor that sells in the US and they're doing well with them, say, hey, do you have mm -hmm. a Canadian market vendor that sells? And then look at the comparables in Canada and talk mm -hmm. to them at first and say, listen, I can't buy the velocity I'm buying in the US because I want to test out the Canadian market. And you might mm -hmm. find they work with you well because of your relationship in the US. Yes. And they might be able to be more flexible off the bat and the minimums you order because you say that I want to expand to Canada. They'll be like, oh, yes, more money in our corporation pocket. But they'll be more flexible to work with you at first until you feel more comfortable with Canada. And if you guys have any questions about Canada or need help making some labels or something, just drop me an email and we'll work through some of those. Great. Thanks again.